I was a young man then. A small fleet had been sighted off the coast of Alinor, and King Hydaleth ordered us to give chase. We sailed far and long in pursuit, breaking into the uncharted waters that surround Pyandinir itself. It was foolish in retrospect, an Alinori fleet following their ships of Chitinous Hull and Membrana sail right into their trap. Our captain, wise beyond his years, warned the Admiral to abandon the course, but the King's orders were clear, and the Admiral, even if he felt it, showed no fear. We sailed the coast, careful to avoid sandbars, and all looked upon the plateaus of the Malmahome, where oceans of viridian jungle rolled and spilled into the sea, forming great stretches of fog-shrouded mangroves. Winds struck up and roiled the waters beneath, and as the haze cleared, numerous of the crew claimed they saw scouts shimmering white-blue through the jungled coasts, and others said they saw monsters breaking the water's murk. Suddenly, the bells of the Admiral's flagship rang its frustrated tune, and the fleet readied to face the enemy that had steered around to engage. I peered ahead with my spyglass and saw the flagship groan to a halt as tendrils of kelp strung up from below and buried into the hull. I glanced to the same fate of the others before a broiling storm drew a sweating mist upon us, and we could barely see a stone's toss beyond the edge of our ship. The water beneath us rocked, and the hissing of serpents heralded the arrival of their fanged moors upon the crew. Our captain had us spin the ship and keep speed as best as we could as we fought off Malma mounted upon serpents and the scaled leviathans that bordered the deck. The captain, a naval prodigy, had some plan of which I had no sense, but our trust in his judgment was true, and so we all followed his precise orders, interrupted only by incursions of the foul beasts that raked their spindle teeth upon splintering wood and dragged all they could into the sullen depths of their own. But somehow, by the grace of Auriel, we survived. We were the only ship, and as we looked back upon the coasts of Pyandinia, we saw our entire fleet swallowed by the coils of serpents that looked as a scaled yarn dragging them into the cerulean abyss. Accounts of survival against the Malma at sea are few, and contemporary encounters with their kind are uncommon. The last documented appearance of the Malma was year 110 of the Third Era in the War of the Isle over 500 years ago. Despite this, there is a wealth of knowledge and a fair share of mystery to uncover about the Pyandineans. The Sea Elves, the Tropical Elves, Fish Elves in derision, the Malma are given all these names by the inhabitants of Tamriel. They are similar in stature and build to the High Elves of Somerset, but the rest of their forms differ significantly in that their eyes are milky white, with irises the palest of blues, sometimes so faint that they appear blank. Their flesh is akin to a colorless jelly, with a translucent, chameleon-like skin of greys, ocean spray blues, or pearlescent whites. Their ears are pointed in elven-like form, but perhaps a little more jagged, reminiscent of a sea creature's fin, and they clearly are adapted to the sea. Their tongues can naturally filter salt water so that they may drink from the ocean. Even a sea elf's tongue, cut, dried, and placed in a pot of seawater, can turn it drinkable for others. They have adapted to live and flourish at sea. Malmer are exceptionally steady on their feet in even the roughest of waters, and nimbler than an acrobat at traversing a ship's rigging. Perhaps an innate advantage rather than a learnt one, their bones are said to be naturally springy. Besides the natural advantages of their form, these elves of Pyandinia have mastered the creatures of their home, bringing unparalleled prowess at sea. The sea serpents native to Pyandinia are terrible creatures capable of standing some 64 feet above the water, and they are tamed and used to the fullest by the Maoma. These serpents are ridden as steeds at sea or used as war beasts to assist in naval incursions. How the sea elves exactly managed to tame such monsters is unknown in the specifics. However, it is said that their king, Orgnum, their deathless wizard leader, uses special arcane rituals which has allowed them to be tamed. My assumption is that Orgnum pioneered this snake magic, which has been a vital part of Malmo life, and it truly is snake magic, for its application does not only apply to the serpents of the sea. Serpent mages and snake charmers, as they are called, can use instruments and magics to charm snakes and serpents of all sizes, land-dwelling or no. 
Malmo employ the use of tamed winged reef vipers to leap from the water and assault the decks of enemy ships, while the sea serpents throw their gargantuan weight against vessels to capsize or crush them. And while on land, Malma employ the scaled reptile canine-like creatures known as Ornorgs. One could say that the sea serpents have become the defining element of Malma culture, used not only as mounts but as a source of hide and teeth, as well as the aesthetic inspiration for their most recognizable motifs. Serpent heads and scales are found incorporated into their totems, their shrines, their ship figureheads, as well as armor and weapon details. There is much speculation and theory crafting to be had with King Orgnum and the Malma snake magic, which we'll get to in due time, but what is even more curious about this snake magic is that it is not only a control and taming art, perhaps of an almost hypnotic nature, but also seemingly an arcane art that can manipulate biology itself. In the past, upon the Cistrus Isles, a Malma serpent caller used her magics upon the eggs of local snakes, changing them to be uncharacteristically aggressive, yet this kind of biological manipulation pales in comparison to the creation of the Leviathans. The book The Scaled Elves described these Malma mutants and an encounter with them. The spawn of some unholy and sorcerous coupling of sea elf and sea serpent, these giants stand a head and a half over the most towering of Nords when they draw themselves to their full height. A rare sight, since these elves mostly carry themselves in a beastly posture, bent and arced like a snake ready to strike. When they do make their move, they don't so much stride as slither along in an uneven predatory lope, like they're unused to both land and legs. The first time I laid eyes on one in the flesh, she was clambering up the hull of my ship like a centipede, weaving back and forth as she effortlessly glided up the slippery boards. The way the light glittered off her blue scales was almost beautiful, but her dead, white eyes were as impassive as a shark's, and her grin as mirthless. I doubled over in fright as she shot over the starboard railing. She was on me in an instant, pinning me to the deck with her great size, ready to strike me down with a killing blow, or so I thought. Instead, she regarded me with a chilling dispassion, and I froze like a mouse that's locked eyes with a snake. I was both captivated and terrified. It was the popping of her jaw stretching out of place to swallow me that finally snapped me out of my shock and gave me the sense to struggle. I was no match for the Leviathan's strength, but I managed to wrest a hand free and drive it into the back of her throat. The gout of flame she choked on put an end to her perverse existence, but the mark she left on me I'll carry until the end of my days. If you should ever see the scaled elves lurking below the waves, my prayers go with you. I would think that the creation of the Leviathans most certainly is done with some degree of sorcery that I would deign to assume is snake magic. Though the arcane abilities of the Malma certainly do not stop at snakes, they have made themselves the apex predators at sea, as Malma sea mages can conjure winds and storms to topple foes ships and turn the tides in the most literal sense. There are many adepts of storm magic among them which can use their powers to tear at fleets, dragging them into a sea of whirlpools before the serpent mounted riders and the Malmuri ships finish off the survivors. But some of the most dangerous examples of Malma storm magic have been harnessed through the use of serpent-shaped storm totems. Powered by siphoning life energy from sacrifices, these totems, in rituals orchestrated by powerful storm mages, can conjure entire hurricanes fit to destroy enormous fleets and control the seaways. Malmo seek advantages like this often, preferring hit-and-run tactics and deception. In fact, entire guides have been written for sailors of Somerset, informing their readers about the dangers at sea. As their name suggests, the sea elves are so able at plying the waves that a Malma ship can remain at sea indefinitely so long as it is seaworthy. The Malma take advantage of that fact when raiding our trade vessels or ambushing our fleets. Never pursue a retreating sea elf vessel even if you think they are hobbled. They will bait you into thinking you can catch them, but make no mistake, sea elf cutters are faster than any ship in our fleet. Soon you will find yourself lured into the open ocean, unable to save safely retreat while they circle you like sharks. Your food stores will dwindle and once you are finally too weak to put up a fight, the Malma will swoop in to slaughter you. It is a cowardly but effective tactic. Secondly, never flee a sea elf vessel unless you can see land. 
Even then, do so with great care. It is not a matter of if the Malmo will overtake you, it is when. The best course of action when confronted by Malmo ships is to stand and fight. At least then you have some hope of coming out ahead. Sea elf fleets are most often composed of small, agile vessels well suited to quick hit and run engagements. Bloody their noses quickly and you may drive them off before they are committed to their attack. When fighting the Malma, their ballistae are the least of your troubles. They can turn the seas themselves against you. Any ship larger than a sloop is sure to have at least one of their sea mages beneath its sails, conjuring wind and storm to toss you about like a toy boat. Every effort should be made to neutralize the Malma sea mages as quickly as possible. If the waves have not yet done you in, the sea elves will sick their beasts on you. Malmo breed and train a variety of marine predators to bolster their ranks, from winged reef vipers that can leap high out of the water and onto your deck, to sea serpents large enough to capsize a warship. In either case, keep moving at a steady clip, and the creatures will have difficulty reaching you before they tire. It is clear that the Malma have dominion at the sea. Throughout the millennia, slavery, piracy, and tenuous alliances have been a part of their history, but there is no single greater goal for the Sea Elves than the destruction of the Ultima that are the center of their seaborne hatred. This is where we get to go back, long back, and connect some dots. Here is what we know for a fact. Ever since seemingly the race's inception, the Malma have been ruled by King Orgnum, the deathless wizard who is not only immortal, but grows more youthful by the century. Keep note of that. And unlike many of the other elven diasporas, such as the Sigix, Aelids, Kaima, and the Dureni, the diaspora of the Sea Elves seems to stretch back much further into the Marethic Era, to the Dawn Era even, when Aldmeris was whole. The third edition of the Pocket Guide by the Imperial Geographic Society says this on the matter. It was once believed that the Malma of Pyandania were originally exiles from the Somerset Isle, but while it is likely they came from similar Aldmeri ancestors, they certainly did not come from Somerset. Translations of tapestries in the Crystal Tower tell of a far older enmity. The Malma were likely separated from the ancient Aldmer not in Somerset, but in their original homeland of Aldmeris. Orgnum, their leader and self-styled king, according to the legend, was a phenomenally wealthy Aldmer nobleman who used his finances to launch a rebellion against the powers of the land. He and his followers were banished for this to a place separated from Aldmeris by an impenetrable mist, Pyandania, the Veil of Mist. The boundary proved so effective that the followers of Orgnum never again disturbed their former countrymen. The new Old Mary homeland of Somerset, however, was not so lucky. It is this version of events and perception of Orgnum that is corroborated in the essay The False Revanchism of the Malma, written by Hayden Drill of Skywatch. It says, The ages old conflict between Ultima and Malma has raged so continuously and so long that it is easy to come under the impression that it is a complicated struggle, built layer upon layer, century upon century, of two sided wrongs and reprisals. This is a fallacy of the most harmful order. It grants a hint of legitimacy to deprivations that deserve none. The Malma have never held claim over the Isles of Somerset, and God's willing, they never shall. I fear the fallibility we have developed in our fall from Old Mary Grace has led to the common misconception that we are close siblings to those who dwell in Pyandania. But the truth of the matter is that we are far distant cousins with only a shred of common ancestry. This welcome revelation comes from previously untranslated Old Mary tapestries within the Crystal Tower. The unmitigated truth revealed at last after painstaking study speaks not of a common plight of reluctant migration and tragic diaspora, but a tale of treachery and exile. The blood the Malma spill has always been in the name of greed and hungry ambition. Their corrupt king, Orgnum, thought to usurp our ancient homeland of Old Maris from its rightful rulers, just as he seeks to steal Somerset from us. The Malma are a despicable people who do not deserve the guilt of conscience some have afforded them for too long. Any debate on the matter is closed, the Malma apologists are silenced, and the prosecution of war against the Pyandineans should be carried out without remorse. Clearly, this piece is ideologically driven, and the author's opinions, justified or no, are firm and unwavering. However, there are some interesting perspectives written by the very hands of the Malma from the Sea Lord Malaroth of Pyandania. Many still believe that the Malma of Pyandania diverged from the racial line of Ultima when they were exiled from the Somerset Isle as criminals. This is the great traitorous lie of the Ultima. 
Translations of tapestries in the Crystal Tower reveal that the Great Maoma race is directly descended from the purest strain of our Old Mary ancestors. We certainly did not come from Somerset, but originated in our ancestral homeland of Old Maris. The Ultima themselves are a mongrel race. They are the abomination that drove our great leader Orgnum to lead our people through the impenetrable mists to our haven of Pyandania. For centuries, we have marshaled our forces in preparation for our triumphant return. Somerset is ours by right of our birth as the one true Old Mary race. All traces of the inferior Ultima race and their mongrel blood must be wiped from the face of Tamriel. This too is ideologically motivated and makes some truly interesting claims, suggesting that the Maoma are the purest descendants of the Old Mary ancestors and that the Ultima are a mongrel race. Now, despite the fact that both are ideologically divided and each claim they are the pure descendants of Old Maris, all sources seem to agree that the Sea Elves split from the Ultima before the destruction of Old Maris. And of course, the Maoma suggest that King Orgnum is not a traitorous rebel. So right now I'm going to present to you a theory as if it were truth. I want you to absorb this fully as if it were canon information as an experiment and an attempt to disarm your preconceived notions of Elder Scrolls history. First, when dealing with the tales of the Ultima, I find that the Elder Scrolls community typically seems to consider Ultimary views as more correct, particularly about history and the metaphysical nature of Mundus, and there are reasons for this. Chief among them, they are a long-lived race and one of the longest living continual civilizations of Nern. However, the folly is to assume that throughout the thousands of years of Ultimary society that there has not been any ideological perversion of the truth. Thalmor, anyone? Clearly, the Ultima are subject to ideology, which affects their interpretation of history and cultures, as is the case with all others. Secondly, we must consider that when the Ultima claim to be the purest descendants of the Ultima, we usually take this at face value due to several factors, some of which are the long lives of themselves and their civilization, but many are also associated with our conceptions of heavens and valuables. For example, the name High Elf immediately confers ideas of superiority and perhaps even literally higher status. Their golden skin, eyes and hair obviously share the color with one of the most valuable and cherished materials materials, gold. This on top of the Tolkien-esque elven prescriptions, we tend to assume that the Ultima look closest to the Oldma, hence are the closest descendants, and this could well be true. However, there are other possibilities. For example, there are already problems with established Ultimary ideas regarding lineage. One such that the Bosma came from Somerset Diasporas, as the Bosma have their own myths about their origins as part of a primordial ooze, and their forms given in pact with Ifri, or with the Khajiit who believe they were created from elven stock by Azura, whose existence predates Topol the pilot's expeditions from Somerset, which means that there had to be elven stock available to Tamriel to be changed. That ends the unexplained presence of the Falmer with no direct connection to be made to Somerset, and who is to say that the Falmer are not the purest descendants of the Oldma, perhaps remaining in Skyrim even after the Sundering, assuming we believe the theory that Tamriel is what remains of Old Maris. Anyways, all this is said to open your minds so you can indulge this whack job theory. What if the forms of the Malma were in fact closest to the Oldma? Elnafe is the term that describes the spirits that were trapped in Mundus after creation. Some became the earth bones, that is the spirits of the world, the physical laws and such. Others became the wandering Elnafe, the races of man. And others who remained in a stable place, unchanged by chaos, they were the old Elnafe who would become the old Ma. The name old Elnafe is also interchangeable with old Maris. At some point, the Elnafe transitioned from a spiritual form to a corporeal form with physical properties and they were forced to procreate and be mortal. What if instead of looking upon the sea elves as sea-themed, we instead look at them as these translucent, ghostly, undefined prenatal forms that are the transitory forms of Elnafe to becoming elves, the earliest? What if the Oldma looked most similar to the Malma of today and that their claims are in fact true? Let us consider that they have had the very same King Orgnum since the days of Old Maris. Their society is as long-lived, longer-lived even, than the Ultima of Somerset. Does that not lean any credence to their word? 
Of course, they're subject to ideological driven perversions of truth, but the same is absolutely true of the Ultima. Is it not possible that the Ultima appeared like these not concretely defined prenatal forms and the earliest schism of Ultima, led by King Orgnum, went to Pyandinia, veiled by mist, and here they adapted somewhat to their environment, but remained the closest to the Ultima from whom they split, as Old Maris itself was sundered in the wars against men. The claim that they are the closest to the Ultima in blood is not far of a stretch when you consider that they have been in Pyandinia isolated since before the sundering of Old Maris. If we imagine the Ultima looked like this, I can imagine that the sundering caused the people to split and their biology still closer to Elnafe, and hence more moldable, changed to suit their environment, whether that be Bosma, the Falma, or the Ultima even. Perhaps their very own ideology and reverence of ancestors shaped their forms to reflect their elitist views, gifting them golden forms that stretch tall to the heavens. I'm just spitballing now, but at the end of the day, it's a very cool theory to consider, and I often think with the Elder Scrolls, you'll get much more fun out of it challenging the status quo beliefs, and even if you don't believe the fringe theories in the end, indulging in their point of view helps you strengthen your own normative argument. So it is entirely possible that Orgnum was just a salty lord of Old Maris, pun intended, who himself was opportunistic and rebelled against order, and for that he was banished to the Veiled Mist, which was Pyandinia. Regardless of which view you hold about Old Mary purity, we at the least know that the Malma split from the Ultima before the sundering of Old Maris, which is before High Lord Turinen first set foot on Somerset and founded the city of First Hold on Oridon. So this Sorcerer King is bound to hold many secrets and untold lore, but let us discuss what we know and what is said about him, then see if we can tie some of the threads together. Sorcerer King, Immortal Monarch, Snake King, Young King, all these titles have been applied to King Orgnum, the voice of the free Malma people, commander of twelve dozen and one mighty ships. He, the Deathless Wizard, is not only immortal, but is actively growing younger with each century's passing. He split from the Aldmer with his followers when Aldmeris was still whole, and his followers have become the Malma of Pyandinia. He has made an eternal enemy of the Elves of Somerset, a sentiment the majority of the Malma share, and it is his magics and leadership that have defined their culture. His pioneering snake magics have allowed the Malma to tame the sea serpents, and their heavy armor even employs the use of a mysteriously light metal named Orgnium, no doubt in homage to their king and perhaps also created by him. Consider that there are other legends out there that attribute specialties with metals and crafts to him, such as one which credits King Orgnum as the first person to craft with silver, drawing it from the earth of Tamriel like splinters from a wound. And of course, there is his renowned artifact. King Orgnum's coffer is a legendary magical chest that despite its ordinary appearance and its small size, offers gold of an unlimited supply. Apply. This weightless coffer, no matter how much gold is taken from it, replenishes as if nothing had ever been taken. A sorceress craft, likely of his own design, and if he truly was the first to work silver, then it could be said that Orgnum has some affinity for rare metals. This magical coffer supplied the vast wealth needed to maintain his fleets, but at the last known appearance of Orgnum at the War of the Isle, the coffer was lost, and interestingly, the Malma have not had a documented appearance in Tamriel since. That he is a pioneer of snake magic and silver are also not the most mysterious things about this fellow. As an immortal wizard king, he has interacted with the denizens of Tamriel many times, mainly through invasions, but Tamrielic myths also record certain legends and stories about Orgnum, the sea elf king. Khajiit tales tell of Nurarion, they called him the perfect, but some said he was the voiceless, for only his foes heard him speak. In the ancient days, Nurarion was brother to the king of Sunhold. Terrible storms swept their shores each season, brought by Orgnum of the Malmo, the young king. In order for Nurarion to best Orgnum, he had to turn to the Prince of Bargains, Clavicus Vile. He asked for a voice that could call forth a doom greater than any called by Orgnum. Unfortunately, he got his wish. Nurarion decided to lead the mages of Sunhold in a counterspell. His newfound voice sent Orgnum storms to the ends of the earth, but even his normal speech meant ruin for all who heard it. He could no longer live at court and risk the lives of others, and so he had saved his beloved Sunhold, but was forced into exile. 
The Nords have their tales about Gajardil the Keelhauler, an explorer who sailed from Atmora all the way to Yakuta despite half her crew falling mad along the way. She discovered new lands, new cultures, and her most famous adventure was to raid the palace of King Orgnum himself, and she managed to escape Pyantania with her life intact. The Elves of Somerset too have had many legends and stories regarding Orgnum, such as the play The Bright Blade of Captain Castatil, where the protagonist seeks his father's murderer, King Orgnum, who in fact turns out to be his very own father in the guise of the Sea Elf King. That aside, the point is that all of the people of Tamriel have their stories and plays and fictions regarding the Malma King. You will hear many strange stories and suggestions. There are banners that depict King Orgnum with three hands, and some historians speculate that certain Malmuri serpent shrines depicting three coils are meant to be depicting Orgnum as a great sea serpent. This could be seen as rather far-fetched, however, when we consider that his snake magics allowed the Malma to tame the sea serpents, and we also know that through sorcerous crossbreeding, the Leviathans have been created, then is it so crazy to suggest that Orknum could be a sea serpent, or at the very least have a sea serpent form? As well, we must also address the curious assertions that King Orknum is in fact the god Satakal. It may be weird to suggest that Satakal, the world skin, the Yakutan serpent god of everything, whose closest equivalent to Tamrielic pantheons is a fusion of Anu and Padme, is connected to Orgnum, but funnily enough, there are a few more reasons to indulge this theory. Firstly, there are some of the more surface level aesthetic and thematic connections. Satakal is the world snake, and as discussed, King Orgnum is a master of snake magic and has exerted his will over the great sea serpents and land snakes of all kinds, plus included in the capacity of snake magic also seems to be the ability to mould the forms of snakes and create hybrids like the Malma Leviathans. Consider also that King Orgnum is said to be deathless and growing younger with each passing century. Could this be somehow related to Satakal, who in Redguard creation myth is the god of the real world rather than the skin ball of Sep, their version of Lorcan. Before Mundus, the Yakutans believed that the spirits had to learn the way of the walkabout in order to survive the cycles of Satakal, who would eat its own tail and then begin anew, an Ouroboros essentially. What if the King Orgnum, the ancient being that he is, was somehow the inspiration for the god Satakal? If we think of his ever-growing youthful appearance, perhaps this is related to shedding skin in a way, casting off his aged form and renewing it ever younger each century. This could explain why he is deathless and why he has a mastery of snake magic. Consider that the Sinistral Elves, a group of elven kind in Yakuta that is largely unaccounted for, perhaps an offshoot like the Malma before Old Maris was sundered, or perhaps an offshoot of the Malma themselves even, who knows, but the Yakutans fought and defeated the Sinistral Elves in their homeland and perhaps even King Orgnum, maybe even in a sea serpent form if historian musings on the Malmuri serpent shrine are to be believed, actually helped the Yakutans defeat the Sinistral Elves and hence then became a focal point of their reverence in the form of Satakal. Maybe the Sinistral Elves were among those Oldma who cast Orgnum out and he had reason to take revenge upon them and help the Yakutans against them. Then of course, throughout the sinking of their homeland Yakuta and the colonization of Hammerfell, any relation of Satakal to the Sea Elves was lost in their mythic histories. It's an interesting possible theory. What is stranger is that there is Satakal worship found among the Malma as well. Arguably, this could be due to cross-cultural pollination that happened on the high seas between the Yakutans and the Malma, as they're both navally skilled races and may have had contact. However, it is also possible that Malmuri reverence of Satakal is because they see Satakal as a deified version of Orgnum, or perhaps they see Orgnum as an avatar of Satakal. The exact nature of this curiosity is at the moment largely unexplained, and we can only really speculate, but as you see, there is more than just serpentine aesthetics that could possibly tie these two entities together. If we want to get real comparative in mythology, perhaps Orgnum rebelled against the Old Mary back before Old Maris was sundered, not because he was greedy and power hungry as the Ultima claim, but instead because he saw the folly of Auriel, king of the Ultima, and he knew he was foolish to trust Lorcan in creation. And so Orgnum turned against him in hopes of becoming the new king of the Ultima, but he was defeated and outcasted to Pyandania beyond the mist. And in the end, he was right. Lorcan turned out to be a trickster, 
Auriel and the other Old Mary gods were fooled, and the war they would end up having with Lorcan's armies of men sundered Old Maris. Perhaps this is why he has such a hatred for the Ultima, descendants of those Ultima who refused to listen, and perhaps this is why he's considered Satakal in Yakutan myth. Listen to the Yakutan story of the Monomyth. Pretty soon the spirits of the Skinball, aka Mundus, started to die because they were very far from the real world of Satakal, and they found that it was too far to jump into the far shores now. What if these far shores to the real world of Satakal is Pyantania behind an impenetrable veil of mist, and Orgnum is Satakal himself, and this made for a mythic tale of the Yakutans that warped with their cultural flavour? I may be stretching this far, and this theory is far from concrete, but it is an important thinking exercise, and I'd love to see what connections you guys can make in the comments. Remember, there are multiple lenses through which to view the Elder Scrolls lore. At both extremes, you can have a very myth-makes-reality lens, war of manifest metaphors and all that, or you can try to apply a more realistic lens and explain the bloodlines and development of gods and pantheons as emerging culture and ideology. And to be honest, my opinion is that the Elder Scrolls lore is certainly a little bit of both, but it's always good to explore the lore and theories through multiple angles. Ultimately, the vast seas of Nern hold many mysteries. The Malma, the Slow, the Dregs, and so much of it is wrapped up in legends and mythologies with one-line mentions or abstract connections, but for now I'm going to remove my tinfoil cap and speak of the long-awaited Elder Scrolls VI that is earliest releasing in 2028. R.I.P. Elder Scrolls fans. There's lots of speculation and reason to believe that Hammerfell or High Rock or both will be the setting for Elder Scrolls 6, but who knows how ambitious they'll be. Regardless, I imagine ship traversal across the seas will likely be a part of things, especially if it is Iliac Bay focused. And if so, I think a return of the Malma could be a really damn cool opportunity, perhaps even as an ally for the Red Guards to fight a common enemy in the Thalmor. There are so many possibilities, and maybe they could even be a playable race. They've been established enough in the Elder Scrolls Online, and it could provide some awesome role-playing opportunities and expand upon their lore and reveal more secrets about them. We can dream and hope, but ladies and gentlemen, I think that's all I have to say on the Malma at this current moment. I want to thank Pool Charm Solus for creating these beautiful armor mods that truly do the sea elves justice, making them feel exotic and alien. And I want to thank you guys for watching to the end. Please do give the video a like and contribute your takes on the mysteries of the sea elves down below. My name's Scott from Fudge Muppet, and I'll be back to nerd out with you again.